Look at that beast. The beast of Revelation chapter 13, seven heads and ten horns. Scary looking. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. What is this bizarre beast? Notice it's comprised of elements of three, leopard, bear, and lion. Interesting. Only one other place in the Bible are these three beasts mentioned together. The books of Daniel and Revelation are often referred to as the prophetic twins. They go hand in hand. And indeed, in Daniel chapter 7, we find these three beasts mentioned together. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. Daniel 7 verses 2 and 3. And here were the beasts that Daniel saw. The lion, the leopard, the bear, and the dragon. Now the lion, the leopard, and the bear, and the dragon are all mentioned in Revelation 13. Fascinating. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. It was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Daniel 7, verse 4. And suddenly another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 5. After this I looked, and there was another like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. That's verse 6. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Verse 7. So Daniel, wanting to know, what is this all about? What is this vision? First of all, in Bible prophecy, we find a number of symbols. Seas often represent peoples. Example, Revelation 17, verse 15. Winds often refer to war. Jeremiah 49, verses 36 and 37. Beasts represent kingdoms. Daniel 7, verse 17. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the others. Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Daniel chapter 7, verses 3 and 17. That is for kings or kingdoms. That's our prophetic key. Well, this rings a bell. In chapter 2, there was reference to four kingdoms. Remember the image of gold and silver and bronze and iron? Now we find four kingdoms mentioned again in chapter 7. Now the four kingdoms in chapter 2 were Babylon, as you recall, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Are the four kingdoms of Daniel 7 the same as the four kingdoms of Daniel 2? Interesting question. We'll answer that question in our study tonight. All right, the first beast. Here we go. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off. 
It was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. And a man's heart was given to it. Daniel 7 verse 4. All right. Was the winged lion Babylon? Let's look at some clues. Now, Jeremiah talked about Babylon, the nation, the empire. The lion has come up from his thicket, and the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. Jeremiah 4, verse 7. All right, and who was this lion? Who was this great power? Chapter 20, verse 4. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. Interesting. Ah, Babylon, the golden kingdom. Did you know that the winged lion was a symbol of Babylon? Found engraved on the glazed tile on its walls? Fascinating. Now, notice this intriguing clue. In Daniel's vision, the lion was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. That's verse 4. What's this referring to? Do you recall the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon? The story of Daniel's three friends who were thrown alive into the fiery furnace and miraculously delivered? Did you know that Nebuchadnezzar was converted sometime after that, became a believer in God, and even wrote a chapter in the book of Daniel? He received a new heart, a man's heart. Here's God's promise, talking about conversion. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. A promise of a new heart. So Nebuchadnezzar, king of the ravenous empire of Babylon, became a converted man. Now, interesting story. Of course, Babylon didn't last forever. It lasted till 539 BC. Well, what happened then? What nation took over after Babylon? Notice what happens. The bear comes in. Ah, the bear, the next kingdom. Here's what the Bible says. And suddenly, another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Daniel 7, verse 5. Was the bear Medo-Persia? You recall that the kingdom to follow Babylon in the dream of the metal image was Medo-Persia. Now, was the bear also Medo-Persia? First clue, the word suddenly. Suddenly, another beast, a second, like a bear. Suddenly is very informative. Remember the story of how Babylon fell. King Belshazzar held a riotous feast. In the midst of that riotous feast, he saw letters of fire upon the wall. Remember that Daniel interpreted those letters. God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Daniel 5, verses 26 to 28. Now, the fascinating story is that Babylon fell without a fight. There was no protracted siege. There were no great battles. It happened suddenly on one night because, remember the story from our previous study, the guard carelessly left open the two-leaved bronze-barred gates allowing the Persian soldiers to hurry into the city 
and totally destroy the army, take the people captive all in one night? This is recorded, of course, on the Cyrus Cylinder, which archaeologists found. Well, that fits the suddenly clue very well. Now, the second clue is, this is a second beast, the next in succession after the lion. Well, if Babylon was the first empire, then the second empire in succession was Medo-Persia. So once again, it matches the clue. Now, what about the three ribs and the hump that's higher on one side? Well, now the hump higher on one side points to the fact that Persia was more powerful than Media. Persia became the dominant partner in the empire, thus the higher hump. In fact, this was a vast kingdom. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. Now, notice, no longer Medo-Persia, Cyrus, king of Persia, all kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. The Persian Empire. Okay. Now, Persia was more powerful than Media. Now, what about the three ribs? Well, we understand that. Because Medo-Persia conquered three great empires. Egypt, Lydia, and of course, Babylon. Thus the three ribs. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Daniel 7, verse 5. In other words, this suggests a great, a vast empire. Indeed, look how it's described in Esther chapter 1, verse 1. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India to Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces. A vast empire in extent. So then, this tells us that the Second Empire was indeed Medo-Persia, 539 to 331 BC. Excellent. Well now, enter the leopard with four wings. What's this all about? After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Daniel 7, verse 6. Okay. Was the leopard Greece? Let's find out. First clue, the word another. The third beast in succession. Well, then what kingdom followed Medo-Persia? Well, Greece did, of course, historically. Another clue, Daniel 8, verse 20. In this vision showing the ram as Persia and the Greece as a goat. Here's the text. Daniel 8, verse 20. The ram which you saw, having the two horns, they are the kings of Media and Persia. And the male goat is a kingdom of Greece. The large horn that is between its eyes is the first king. Verse 21. This identifies, in succession, Medo-Persia and Greece then. Now, this great horn was Alexander, the leader of the Greeks. And he came ashore conquering everywhere he went. The historian notes, I am persuaded that there is no nation, city, nor people where his name did not reach. There seems to me to have been some divine hand presiding both over his birth and actions. Yes, Alexander the Great Conqueror. Ah, his troops were unstoppable. They could not be stopped. They conquered the Persians. They conquered everywhere. And they did with great speed. The Greek phalanx was unstoppable. The four wings, four wings depicting great speed then. Excellent. All right, well, what about the four heads? What happened when Alexander died? Well, he left no heir that's, that lasted. So his four chief generals took over his empire. Here's the text, Daniel 8, verses 8 and 22. And for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kings shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. 
So Alexander died of alcoholism. His four generals took over, thus the four horns, or the four heads in this case. So the four heads are the four generals. Now finally, it says, dominion was given to it, Daniel 7, verse 6. Okay, a vast, a vast empire. We see this map of the extent of the travels of Alexander's army and the borders of his empire. The red track shows the path his army took conquering everywhere they went. The yellow lines are the boundaries of the Greek Empire. They go off the map in both directions. A vast, vast empire. And Alexander spread Pan-Hellenism, the Greek Hellenistic culture, throughout the ancient world as he conquered. So then, we see good evidence that the leopard beast is indeed Greece, 331 to 168 BC. Very good so far. Now, the dragon. Ah, look at that monster. And what is the dragon? After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel 7, verse 7. Whatever is this? Well, is this fourth beast Rome? You recall that in the dream of the image, the fourth empire, the legs of iron, were Rome. Is this monster beast also Rome? First clue, it was the fourth beast in succession. Well, which kingdom conquered Greece? Rome did. So the fourth beast would suggest Rome. What kingdom conquered Greece? Rome. There you go. Another clue. It had huge iron teeth. Now that means powerful. Remember the word iron and the legs of iron pointing to Rome? Gibbons puts it this way, the images of gold, of silver, or brass that might serve to represent the nations and their kings were successively broken by the iron monarchy of Rome. Ah, and notice this clue, devouring, breaking in pieces. In other words, nothing could stand before it. Well, the Roman legions were unstoppable. They even stopped and conquered the Greek phalanx. Nothing could stand before them. Yes, Rome was victorious everywhere it went. It waxed great, the empire. On the right, Caesar Augustus. Now this was a world empire. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So Rome was indeed a world empire, all the world. Okay, another clue. The Bible says it was different from all the beasts that were before it. What's this talking about? Look at this clue. What's this inscription on this remnant of the temple to Jupiter? There in Rome. These words say, Senatus Populus Quae Romanus, meaning what? The Republic of Rome, the Senate and the people of Rome. You see, the first three empires were kingdoms. They were governed by one supreme leader. Rome began as a republic. It was different. This suggests clearly that this fourth beast was indeed Rome. Now what about the ten horns on the head of this beast? The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. Daniel 7 verse 24. 
Now, okay, ten kings will arise from this kingdom. Were the ten horns the ten tribes who conquered Rome? You remember that Rome was conquered by ten barbarian tribes. Are these ten horns the same ten tribes depicted here? Well, it said they'll arise from this kingdom. In other words, from the territory of the Roman Empire. Indeed, the ten tribes arose out of the territory of the Roman Empire. So that matches. Good. Ah, the story of the sack of Rome. Yes, after centuries, they finally conquered the eternal city. And they enjoyed it. They loved it. They took over. The Germans, the Swiss, the French, the Italians, the English, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and three more who are now extinct. Very good. This clearly matches then the ten kings who conquered Rome. And now the story gets really interesting. I considered the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. Verse 8. Fascinating. What's the story of this little horn? Behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 7, verse 8. This gets even more interesting. So this little horn had a mouth and eyes, a mouth speaking great things, pointing to a man leading in charge somehow. Who is this power? Okay, let's identify it. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom, and another shall rise after them. It says after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Verse 24. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and time and some half a time. Daniel 7 verse 25. So then, let's summarize the clues to identify this little horn. It came up among the ten horns. It came up after the ten horns. It was different than the ten horns. It uprooted three of the ten horns. It would speak pompous words. It would persecute the saints. It thought to change times and laws. Had power for a time and times and half a time. Who or what is this little horn? We shall discover it as we study here. Look at the clues. First of all, the word little is circled. This would be a very small kingdom. You recall that the other kingdoms, the bear, the lion, the leopard, had vast territory. This suggests that this power would have a little territory. Coming up among them, among the ten horns, that is, within the territory of the Roman Empire, shall arise after them. In other words, after the ten horns conquered Rome. Here's the story of what happened. It's a fascinating story. By the 4th century AD, the Roman Empire had become so large as to be unwieldy and incapable of governance from one location. Accordingly, during the 330s AD, the Emperor Constantine built an eastern capital on the banks of the Bosphorus and named it Constantinople. He left Rome and moved into Constantinople, assuming direct responsibility for the governance of the Eastern Empire. However, Constantine faced a problem, a problem of leadership. For over 200 years, Rome had been racked by internal conflict. Most of the trained ruling class had been executed by rival emperors. The Christian church 
had emerged as the only cohesive political unit in the city of Rome. Therefore, when Constantine transferred his seat of power to Constantinople, he conferred governance of the Western Empire upon the Bishop of Rome and the Christian Church. Notice this quotation. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. He shall be different from the first ones, Daniel 7, 24. Different how? Well, all the others were secular powers, but this one is a religious power, quite different. What does history reveal? Out of the ruins of the Roman Empire, there gradually arose a new order of states. The central point was the papal see, that is the Pope. Therefore, inevitably, resulted a position not only new, but what does it say? Very different from the former. It was different. Okay, a religious power, different from the former. Quote, the Bishop of Rome, in the seat of Caesar, was now the greatest man in the West, and was soon forced to become the political as well as the spiritual head. To the Western world, Rome was still the political capital, hence the whole habit of mind, all ambition, pride, and sense of glory, and every social prejudice favored the evolution of the great city in the ecclesiastical capital. Civil as well as religious disputes were referred to the successor of Peter for settlement. Fascinating account. And shall subdue three kings. Again, Daniel 7, 24. What's this talking about? Well then, a struggle for power ensued which lasted 200 years. Although Constantine had endowed the church with political power, that did not become predominant immediately. It took time. Three nations opposed the supremacy of the Pope. The Heruli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals. These were Aryan nations, by the way. Okay. Notice this commentator. I might cite three that were eradicated from before the Pope out of the list first given. That is the Heruli under Odovasser, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. Heruli, Vandals, Ostrogoths. These three were stamped out by the Pope and the Roman armies because they would not acknowledge his supremacy. And when did this happen? It was completed by 538 A.D. That was after the Ten Horns had conquered Rome. Vigilius ascended the papal chair, 538 A.D., under the military protection of Belisarius, that's Justinian's general. All right. So then, we have this power that has gradually become greater and greater. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man and a mouth speaking great things. Daniel 7, verse 8. Hmm. So a man, a man is in charge. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and laws. Daniel 7, 25. So speak pompous words, persecute saints, and intend to change times and laws. Notice pompous words, quote, The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. The Pope alone is deservedly called by the name most holy because he alone is the vicar of Christ. He's likewise a divine monarch and supreme emperor and king of kings. Hence the Pope is crowned with a triple crown as king of heaven and of earth and of the lower regions. Moreover, the superiority and the power of the Roman pontiff 
by no means pertain only to heavenly things, but to earthly things and to things under the earth, but are even over angels, than whom he is greater. So that if it were possible that the angels might err in the faith, or might think contrary to the faith, they could be judged and excommunicated by the Pope. For he is of so great dignity and power that he forms one and the same tribunal with Christ. The Pope is, as it were, God on earth, sole sovereign of the faithful of Christ, chief king of kings, having plenitude of power, to whom has been entrusted by the omnipotent God direction not only of the earthly, but also of the heavenly kingdom, end quote. What do you think of them apples? That's quite a statement, isn't it? An official statement, Pope Leo XIII, we hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. Wow. Well, did this power persecute the saints? Notice this quotation from the historian. The Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind has shed more innocent blood. And from one of its own leaders, Cardinal Bellarmine, writing in the 16th century, almost an infinite number, he's speaking of heretics here, were either burned or otherwise put to death. Now as early as the 16th century, centuries ago, almost an infinite number, this writer said, had been put to death. Incredible. And again, this power would intend or think to change times and laws. Daniel 7.25. Did this power do that? Notice the claim of authority. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. The Pope is of so great authority and power that he can modify, explain, even divine laws. The Pope can modify divine law since his power is not of man but of God, and he acts in the place of God upon earth with the fullest power of binding and loosing his sheep. Wow, what a statement. Did the Church of Rome exercise this claim of power? Ah. The Church of Rome intended, thought to change times and laws. They removed the second commandment, which prohibits idolatry. Why? Because of all the images. They changed the fourth commandment by removing any reference to the seventh day and split up the tenth commandment into two parts, naming them nine and ten. Oh yes, they intended to change times and laws. Notice this quote from the Catholic Encyclopedia. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath or seventh day of the week to the first, made the third commandment refer to Sunday as the day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. Wow. That's volume four, page 153. And finally, the saints shall be given unto his hand for a time and times and half a time. Daniel 7.25 the question of this span of time, time and times and half a time. Well, we notice that the word in the Hebrew and Aramaic here marks a definite space of time, sometimes, for example, a year. Syriac and Chaldean denotes both time and year. That's Cassinius, Hebrew and Chaldee lexicon. All right. Notice for Isaac Newton's comment on this passage. Three times and a half, that is for 1260 solar years, reckoning a time for a calendar year of 360 days and a day for a solar year. So this is a well-established principle for centuries, time and times and half a time. And notice the example of day for a year principle. I've given you a day for each year, Ezekiel 4 verse 6, so a time is one year, 360 days, times equals two years, 720 days, that's Jewish years, that is Hebrew years, 
half a time is half a year, 180 days, totaling 1260 days. Each day represents then one year. Okay, reviewing. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. Therefore, the starting point is 538 AD. Okay, now then, that takes us to 1798. What happened to the papacy in 1798? Okay, here we go, the smoking gun piece of evidence. What happened 1260 years after the papacy got its temporal power? Mm -hmm. Napoleon took away the papacy's power to persecute. In 1798, he, that is Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. There we go, exactly as the prophecy had foretold. A time and times and half a time, 1260 years, and the power was taken away at the end of that time. There you have it. So then, reviewing the clues, the papacy was a little kingdom, the tiniest kingdom in geographic territory in the world today. It came up after the Ten Horns. It was different from the Ten Horns. It uprooted three of the Ten Horns. It was headed by a man. It spoke boastful words. It persecuted the saints. It thought to change times and laws. And it had power for a time and times and half a time. And there you have it. The evidence is clear. The little horn is the papacy. So then, the ten kings... 476 AD, the papacy came to power, 538 AD, had power for 1260 years. Let's now summarize everything we've seen. The lion is Babylon, invaded Judah, it's a symbol of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar was converted, the bear is Medo-Persia, it came after Babylon came suddenly. Persia was stronger, hence the higher hump. The three empires, or the three ribs, that were conquered. Vast territory. A leopard is Greece, after Medo-Persia. Great speed of its armies. Four generals took over the kingdom. Vast territory. A dragon is Rome. It came after Greece. It was a republic, so it was different. It conquered the world, the known world at that time. It was sacked by the ten tribes, hence the ten horns. The little horn is the papacy. It was a little kingdom. It arose out of Rome. It arose among the ten tribes. It arose after the ten tribes. It was different from them. It destroyed three tribes. It was headed by a man. It spoke boastful words. It wore out the saints with terrible persecutions. It attended to change times and laws. And it reigned for 1260 years. The Bible rests its case. The evidence is persuasive, clear, and convincing. Ah, this is the origin of this horrible antichrist beast. In a later study, we'll find out what that beast is going to do to the world. But there's good news. The good news is that Jesus will come back and destroy that terrible power. 
the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. Daniel 7 verse 26. Amen to that. Praise God. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Daniel 7, 27. So we see then that these people, the persecuted ones, the oppressed ones, those who were tortured and imprisoned and lost everything in this world, cast into terrible tortures, having to flee their homes and live in the mountains, being burned at the stake. Yes, these people shall receive the kingdom. Why? Because they put God first, above everything else, above their possessions, above even their family sometimes, above their own lives, because they cherished God's holy word, the Bible. We would do well to follow their example of faithfulness today. There's an old song that goes like this. Faith of our fathers burning still, in spite of dungeon, fire, and sword. Oh, how our hearts beat high with joy whenever we hear that glorious word. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Today is that your decision as it is mine to do honor to the example of their faithfulness, to honor God, to put him first in your life no matter what it costs that you choose to obey his holy word, the Bible, to follow Jesus all the way. Won't you join me in making that sacred decision right now? It's a prayerful decision. It's an important decision. It's a life-changing decision. And if we contemplate it, we can be sometimes worried, perhaps, or contemplate the cost of doing it. After all, if I put Jesus first in my life in every area, what's going to happen to me? What will it cost me? What will I lose? Yet, if that thought comes into your mind, remember what Jesus went through for us. Jesus went through that terrible trial, that ordeal, that mockery, the beatings. Jesus had to carry that heavy cross to the place of his death. Jesus had his hands and feet nailed to that cross. He was innocent of any wrongdoing, but he loved us so much he's willing to give his life to die in our place. What a sacrifice. Jesus hung dying on that cross, perhaps looking down the ages and saying, it's worth it for you and for me. So as we today contemplate the cost of following Jesus. Because Jesus said, if anyone would follow me, let him take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. And that cross comes because of the book that man is holding in the picture, the Bible. But it's worth it because Jesus is walking with him. Jesus is there to help him. Jesus will see him all the way through. If only he will stay with Jesus. Tonight, Will you follow Jesus? Will you take up your cross and follow him? He's waiting for your response. He loves us so much. He loves you. He loves me. He wants to go with you. He wants to help us. He wants to strengthen us. Won't you say, yes, Lord Jesus? I invite you to join me right now as we pray. Father in heaven, we come to you in Jesus' name right now. It's been quite a study tonight, Lord. An overwhelming study. There's been a lot here. And we see that 
the sad history of compromise, of wrongdoing, resulted in death, persecution, terrible sadness. And now we are at a crossroads tonight. We also have a decision to make. Lord, as sometimes we may worry about the cost of making that decision, help us to remember what Jesus went through for us. Help us not to count the cost, but to look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Help us to follow Jesus, to take up our cross daily and follow him. Tonight, if there are those listening to this program who would like to unite in that sacred decision, to follow Jesus all the way, to follow his holy word, no matter what it costs. I invite you as our heads are bowed, as our eyes are closed, to raise your hand in the sight of heaven and say, yes, Lord Jesus, by thy grace, I choose to follow thee. God sees the hands that are rejoicing in heaven. Now may God go with each one, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.